Hey everyone, welcome back to all my listeners. This is episode 12 in season 11. Today is Wednesday, March 20th, 2024. My name is Sonal Patel and this is the Paint the Medical Picture podcast series. All right, you guys, now today's Newsworthy is going to be featuring my new spotlight series on my guests. So I'm going to be rolling out that red carpet once again and shine my spotlight on Sonia Vasuroy and her journey. And of course, my trusty tips and recommendations will be peppered throughout our entire conversation. Let's welcome Sonia Vasuroy. This episode is sponsored by Advanced Coding Services. Let's get into it. Today's episode is sponsored by Advanced Coding Services, a leading medical billing and medical coding school in the United States. Whether you're just starting out or a seasoned professional, our training equips you with the tools and support you need to advance your career. Our medical billing and coding school meets your needs worldwide online or in person with one-on-one support throughout your training. We are committed to helping our alumni and credentialed medical community in keeping up their certifications by offering various avenues for acquiring your continuing education units. In addition to our Mastering the Business of Medicine retreats offered several times throughout the year in different parts of the country, we now offer memberships. You can conveniently earn your CEUs by attending our exclusive members-only webinars. Since our aim is to nurture and grow the careers of individuals who work in the business of medicine, we call our member area the Apple Orchard. Advanced Coding Services. Educate. Nurture. Inspire. Reaching back with a hand up. All right. Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for joining me on another Paint the Medical Picture podcast. This is my 11th season, episode 12. Now, I have a very special guest today that I wanted to welcome. I've been following her on LinkedIn for quite some time, and here I've decided to bring her on to share her story with all of us. So I wanted to welcome Sonia Basuroy. Hi, Sonia. How are you doing today? It looks warm and sunny Hello. wherever you are. <laughs> it, it is. Well, it's, uh, it's warm inside. I don't know about outside yet. I haven't been out, uh, but it's definitely in the, I guess... 50s, I think. Ah. Um, yeah. So thank you for having me on. I appreciate it. Oh, my goodness. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, I am trying in my 11th um, season here to bring on guests that I have been following, conversing with on LinkedIn for quite some time, right? I do like my podcast to feature you know, speakers or thought leaders or, you know, consulting types of professionals that I believe people in my audience could relate to or learn something from. So, you know, I really wanted to try and focus, you know, when I bring a new person on, I really wanted to focus on their journeys because I know I myself, have been, you know, in the spotlight on so many other people's podcasts talking about myself, right? I don't normally (laughs) do that unless I'm invited to talk Mm. somewhere else. Um, And so, you know, I find that you really learn a a lot about yourself as an individual when you take the time to reflect on the past and where you've come from. So for today, I would really like to know some more about, you know, your journey and what it is that sort of makes you tick, what inspired you to, you know, create your own company here as the owner of MedBill Consulting Services, right? That's huge as a female business owner, minority owner. Um, I would love to get into issues like that as well, if you feel comfortable. So I'd love to start talking. Go ahead. Absolutely. Um, yes, thank you. Um, well, so my journey is uh, quite a, um, for me, it was very interesting because, um, and I talk about this a lot, I I didn't, you know, graduate from high school and say, hey, I'm going to be a consultant now. Right. Um, I don't think many people, um, I think there are a lot of people who really just don't know what they want to do, what they want to be. Um, until retirement. So 
Um, I actually started off in the banking industry. Um, I worked in uh, retirements, retirement, uh, the retirement department, and um, it wasn't my choice. My mom used to work for the same bank. Oh, wow. And uh, you know, back then you could just talk to anyone and, hey, you know, my daughter's looking for a job. Do yeah. you have a place for her? And yes, we right. do. Here right. we go. Um, and I barely had to interview. So I got in. I worked there for eight years That's and um, helping uh, customers, um, you know, work with their retirement accounts and uh, did some um, kind of, I kind of developed into more of a trainer. So when uh, new employees came in, I would train them on, um, on IRAs and 401ks and things like that. And um, so that was, it was actually, I was very young. I, um, uh, again, still didn't know what I really, if this is what I wanted to do, but I thought, look, I, it's, you know, I've been here and, um, they, they trust me and they're giving me more opportunities and, uh, I'm just going to go with it. So eight years later, they decided to move a lot of the departments to Sacramento. So I was in San Francisco and they moved this and you could either go with them or you would be laid off. So the nice thing is I did get about six months notice. Um, the terrible thing was, is I was ready to move um, to central uh, California. Uh, um, so I had to, I had to look for a job. And I looked for a job, I looked for a job. And while I was looking for a job um, within the bank, um, I realized that I really didn't want to work in the banking industry. Um, it was a job, but it wasn't my passion, wasn't my career. Mm. And um, in the meantime, I got married. And my husband um, and I, we talked about it. And my husband is like, he's my sounding board. Um, he gives me great advice. He thinks I can move Mount Rushmore so if, any, if I put my mm. mind, mind to it. You know what I mean? So he's like, you really should think about going back to school. I hadn't finished my bachelor's. So I said, you know what? I'm going to do that. But then I started talking to a girlfriend of mine who was in um, a school for radiology, radio, uh, radiologic technology. And I got, I got really curious. I thought, oh, healthcare. I would love to be in healthcare. So I signed up for the program. I didn't go back for my bachelor's. I signed up for the program. I did the two, uh, one, one year of um, school, you know, um, classroom work. And then I got into my clinical rotation and I had um, a medical issue come up and I had to leave. So I quit in the second year and I never went back, but I, re I really enjoyed being in the hospital. And I thought, well, it's kind of too late to go for medical school. Mm -hmm. uh, by that time, I was, um, you know, about to have my first uh, child. And um, my husband said, there's still, you know, bachelor's degree. So I decided to go back for my degree and it wasn't working. Mm -hmm. um, I had my daughter at home with me. So I was with my daughter, I was back in school and, um, about maybe six, seven months into it, uh, we were like, okay, we want to move and buy our house and um, we can't do that on one salary. So I looked for a job and I found a job at one of the, um, so one of the hospitals I started working uh, for. So there are two really large hospital systems in California, one's Sutter Health, one's Kaiser. Mm -hmm. So I started working for Sutter Health wow. and I got a job as an, um, uh, health and safety officer. And uh, my boss at the time had hired me and said, but I'm going to be leaving soon because I am adopting a child and I'm going to go on leave. So we've got a, we've got a few weeks to a few months um, to train you. Six weeks later, she called me and she said, I'm leaving. I'm not, I'm not, I'm going on leave and I'm going to be out for six months. And I was like, Oh my God, this has only mm -hmm. been Six weeks. Six weeks. What am I going to do now? I'm now I'm the health officer, mm -hmm. health and safety officer. Mm -hmm. So that that taught me a lot of things. First of all, you know, it taught me that you've got to be ready, uh, prepare for the worst. 
which mm -hmm. is literally health and safety anyway. <laughs> um, during the during the time that she was gone, um, we had all these major issues. Um, you know, after like a week that she was gone, uh, I got a call from our engineering department saying there's been a sewage overflow and I need to come quick and we have to start calling all the agencies and th this and that and the other. Um, and then I was part of leadership because my my uh, my boss was a director. So I had to go to all the uh, leadership meetings and I was learning about, you know, um, politics and um, just, you know, everything under the sun. And so it was scary, but I liked it, you know. And then um, my daughter and I was in daycare and it was time for her to start um, school and preschool. And uh, we had this conversation again with my husband, are we going to put her in aftercare? Is that something we want to do? And I decided, no, that's not what I wanted to do. So the job that I had then I in health and safety, I could no longer do because it was actually a 24 hour on call. And my husband at that time was traveling a lot for his work. Sometimes he'd be gone three or four times, three or four times a year, up to three weeks each time. Mm -hmm. So I decided to take a step back stay in, stay working part-time, go back to school for my master's and um, stay home with my kids after school. So <laughs> um, it was a lot to take on. I, it, it's no easy feat. Um, I was, you know, taking care of the, I was going to work, taking care of the kids and then um, doing school probably, you know, from like 9 p.m. to, I don't know, to, to one, two o'clock in the morning. Um, and that was for two and a half years, but I, what I really thought was, you know what, I, I, I can really make a career in healthcare and I really wanted to, I wanted to you know, do all kinds of things, you know, pro program management, project management. I'd love to get into leadership. And I was just really trying to kind of, you know, get a, a leg up on that by finishing my degree. So I got my master's degree. I started applying to jobs. Um, and, you know, I had to decide, well, now I'm going to have to go full time because there are no part time leaders, you know, you can't <laughs> do that. <laughs> and uh, hospitals don't really allow you to work from home. That wasn't a thing. That wasn't a know, thing then, even right? 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. So I decided to go back to work full time once I got the right position. Um, if I tell you I had to jump through hoops and almost felt like I was begging for a job that I knew that I, mm -hmm. I deserved, it's not an understatement. I, you know, it, the healthcare business side is so full of, you know, toxicity and the drama and the politics and, you know, it's who, you know, mm -hmm. um, I was, you know, extremely, uh, lucky that I was in a department that I supported. Um, I, I was actually in a facility that I supported four and five departments. So I got to know a lot of people, a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And that helped me, but not enough, you know, with my degree and with my knowledge and with, you know, uh, having great reviews, performance reviews and things like that, I still couldn't find the right position. And then when I did, I was looked over and I never knew why. I never knew why. So, you know, it's right then and there, if I think now, and if I think back then, it's right then and there when I started to, to, to really um, feel, you know, sort of not, not just undervalued, but just completely invisible. Mm -hmm. You know, I just couldn't understand why some of these people who were getting these promotions you know, if you look at their resumes side by side with mine, what's different here? What, mm -hmm. What's happening? Um, so I I tried my best. I, I moved from department to department. I got into program management. Um, one of the programs I really loved was uh, a centering program, which is a group prenatal program. 
I loved that. Um, I was in charge of everything. It was a very small department. Um, there were, there's a medical assistant. Um, there were about 10 doctors who ran uh, the cohorts or the groups. And there was a chief physician. There's always a chief physician and an administrator that runs programs, you know, together. I was the administrator and the chief physician. She was amazing. Um, and we worked really well together. But just like many big organizations, there was a lot of turnover. And so the director that hired me left two months later. Hmm. The, the new director came in didn't want to have anything to do with our little centering program. So she hired a super, uh, a manager to manage this. The manager came in and she about flipped, you know, she took, mm -hmm. it's almost like she took papers and just threw them up in the air and says, I don't like the way you're doing this. I don't this. like it. Right. Oh, let's redo this. And also around that time, my mom had gotten sick. Um, she ended up in the hospital She'd lost some of her memory. Um, and so I actually needed to be with her more and more and more. And they, my parents lived on their own. We were on our own, you know, separate houses. And I, um, I'd worked out something with my previous director. I said, you know, I can do four days a week. And if I can just either work from home on Friday so I can take my mom to her, all her doctor's appointments and whatever. Those are weekly appointments. There was always something, right? Um, so that was fine. And then the, the new manager came in and she said, that's not fine. I don't want you to do that. Though I had absolutely no patient contact. Everything was behind the scenes or working with the doctors, right? right? Um, there was actually no rhyme or reason for mm -hmm. it, except mm -hmm. that she didn't want it that way. Mm -hmm. And, you know, three, four months later, after she had been there and kind of, you know, <laughs> Um, just really turning something that worked so well. And honestly, when I came in, there was only one, this was a brand new program that um, the hospital had adopted. And uh, the person who had actually created all the systems and the processes and procedures and things, um, she had done that for two years, but left. And I was the second person to take over this position. And I could literally not not to change anything because it's really well designed. I could really enhance on that. So I did, um, we created new marketing material. Um, we did some, you know, kind of in-house training for with the other medical assistants so that they can promote the program. And I did presentations to other doctors um, so that they would be on board of this program. And it, it, it just all went to, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> to pot because some manager somewhere who had absolutely no experience just decided she wanted to change everything. And I, I thought, you know what, I, I, I can be here unhappy or I can find something else. So that's what I did. I mean, it just took three months for her um, to pretty much get rid of me. <laughs> um, so I then found another position it's very similar. Um, it was a different program. It was a, a physician health and wellness program. Um, fantastic. And another, it, it was another fantastic program. I mean, these were just, mm -hmm. everything was dedicated to promoting physician health and wellness. And mm -hmm. so it was, it was kind of the same dynamic, the same relationship. I had a chief physician who, you know, kind of um, oversaw the program and ran the Health and, safety, uh, health and safety committee and we met with other doctors and it was me who did everything in the background, right? So, but this was on a much larger scale. We had four facilities that we had to cover and then we had um, up to a thousand doctors oh, wow. that could at any time, now they all didn't attend, you know, pro, it was webinars and conferences all at the same time, but they all got invites and um, we could, you know, we went from one location to the other and we did various activities, had various after kind of after work, work weekend kind of activities. And all of that fell on me to manage, monitor, create, send invites, things like that. And 
the however the 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 relationship was co the complete opposite of what I had in the last um, role, and um, this physician had I had found out later had gone through three other program managers, mm -hmm. all had left mm -hmm. probably within a year because she didn't know how to let go. She was a complete control. Control. Yeah. Break. And um, she, the problem was there was no support and the department, it was just myself, her and my manager. We sat in physician HR. So a lot of our, uh, activities and events overlapped with human resources because they did the onboarding mm -hmm. uh, events and activities for the new doctors. Um, if it wasn't for my coworkers, I would have probably left within like 30 days. Um, but once I started there and, uh, and I thought about it after I left, once I started there is when I started to really experience um, burnout. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it was catching up to me what was really, uh, you know, kind of a light bulb is that um, the hospital itself creates mistrust and that mistrust kind of trickles down to the leadership and the chief physicians so that they can't trust the people that work for them and with them. Not only that, um, they kind of, um, they almost expect, you know, this kind of hierarchy. So if um, the chief physician, she's in charge of this committee and coming up with all these events and activities, she is completely responsible and held accountable for these. And there's a budget that you have to be under. And there are certain things that you can and cannot do. There's a lot of rules and regulations, you know, in the hospital. And so it somehow, and I'm not making excuses for her, but somehow it turned her into, I must have it done this way or I'm not, it's not acceptable. And that was, it went from 40 hour, a position to sometimes 60 hours. I mean, because there are deadlines and because there are, the details are so meticulous, I could not go home and, and not work because I had to make sure everything was perfect. And it drove me to burnout. So in less than a year I left, I think it was about 10 months I left. And you know, what's interesting too is, is the guilt, the guilt just kind of manifests into something bigger than yourself mm -hmm. because I had worked there for 15 years. I had tenure, I had benefits, I had, you know, made so many connections. And I think that was also contributing to the burnout is the fact that I I have to make this this decision. If I I tried to look for another position for a few months, but I completely gave up because my mind, I could not think. Right. I, I was just so overwhelmed you know and so basically again you know had a conversation with my husband um you know and I didn't have to really worry about the kids because they're a lot older now and I it was just he and I and I and now my parents and I had so much going on with my parents too who eventually moved in with me and now I've they've been living with me for seven years I couldn't think of I couldn't think of a, 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 except for a paycheck, I couldn't think of a, a positive reason to stay right. with with the hospital. And um, so I, I just made the decision to leave uh, was, you know, the deciding factor was not, I, I'm, it, things are not gonna get better. I've tried and I've tried and I've tried. And of course, I, you know, I'm not gonna tell you every every year what I tried to do, but believe me when I say, when I got advice from other uh, managers and colleagues, hey, how do I, you know, what can I do um, to get promoted? Or what can I do to have a chance at this job or, you know, this role? Oh, well, maybe, you know, I the, the advice was, 
well, maybe you should leave and come back in a year, apply again, because maybe you're pigeonholed in this kind of job. Okay, so leave and come back. Okay, or maybe you should just go and sort of, you know, work on a project, kind of, you know, offer your services to work on a project, if that's okay, you know, with your current boss. And I'm like, okay, so I would constantly, I'm always in other departments, hey, let me work on this, let me work on this, you know, because I've made connections, so I know managers and I know other employees. I do that and nothing would come out of it. And I kept thinking to myself, okay, the next time, the next time, the next time, and something comes up, they'll definitely remember me because I did this for them. Um, and it didn't happen. And so after a while, you feel kind of beaten up, you mm -hmm. know, you feel like I am just banging my head on the brick wall and nobody's listening. And so um, I decided I, I need I need to just cut ties because otherwise I'm just going to be, I, I don't know what's going to happen. I'm just going to burn out. I don't know what's going to, I'm not going to be able to take care of my family, you know? So I, I left and um, it was the hardest one of the hardest decisions to make, but For sure. um, I took um, I took about a year. I took about a year off. I I just needed to focus on other things and be happy again. And um, luckily, I had great support from my husband. And I told my mom, and my mom's like, "Typical Indian mom. Oh, you can do <laughs> both. You can work <laughs> and have a business if you wanted." <laughs> I was like, mom, I'm not you. No, I just, can't. yeah, <laughs> I just that's can't, difficult. I've got to go. So yeah, I, that's, that was, that's how I came to, uh, to decide to start my own business. Yeah. So Sonia, there's so much to unpack from what you said on your long journey, right? Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, a lot of stories start off with nepotism, right? That getting yes. your foot in the door because your mom, right, in the banking industry, bravo, beautiful. Those days don't really exist anymore, in my opinion, right? right? But I hear you. Um, I know a lot of folks like that that started off that way, and that's wonderful um, that you were there for so long, providing yourself and your husband, your family, stability, right? Even though, yeah. as you stated, loud and clear was not your passion. Right. However, as I heard you talking about it and connecting the dots a little bit, right? It's still finance, um, you know, and that does sort of follow you through um, as you progressed into healthcare. Um, you know, so you do have that foundation in numbers, in advising people on what to do, what's best for them, right? Right. You right. did use that throughout in healthcare as well. Um, and it's unfortunate to hear you say, because I do hear this still in 2024, mm. about the um, hierarchy that exists in large hospital systems. I agree with you. It's there. Um, I am, um, colleagues with so many people that, you know, try to impart change from a leadership standpoint, right? That communication has to flow between these departments. Um, and yeah. there needs to be greater transparency, um, right? Because we seem to forget in these larger organizations that we're all a part of the same team. Like we forget that because we sort of have a tunnel vision mindset. That's how it's constructed. Um, we just focus on yes. ourselves. We stay in our lane. We meet our own metrics. Um, right. And the transparency factor is missing internally. And so I heard that throughout your conversation that sort of spotted along the way. Mm -hmm. um, and it is interesting when you, you know, that, that English American phrase, I always get all of these little terms wrong, but it's hindsight is, 20, is only 2020, 20, 20, like later, something like that, right? <laughs> 
<laughs> so when you are done with something and you have mm -hmm. time to reflect, you right. see that it was right there. Like the writing was on the wall, right? Yeah. But when you're zoomed in so close, when you're in the position, you just can't see it. But you do feel the stress, the burnout, um, all of those feelings boil up inside of us, right? And, but, yeah. but at that time, because we're in the job, we don't have the right. right term for it, right? Right, right. Because we're in it. But once we're out of it, we're like, oh my goodness, that was already happening in like the first 30 days, right? <laughs> yeah. that, that, that feeling of yuckiness right. was already starting up inside me. So yeah, right. I've heard so many of these types of stories and it makes me sad right? Because mm -hmm. our healthcare systems are supposed to be celebrated, right? We're supposed right. to be able to um, escalate internally within. So I hear what you're saying, that, you know, you don't want to just stay in that same job for the next right. however many years within that right. organization, you want to be able to elevate, escalate, meet your next goals, right? Because as humans, right. We want to achieve more, obviously, mm -hmm. um, right? Mm -hmm. There's nothing wrong with that. But yeah, I, I hear what you're saying. The um, disconnect exists in leadership. And it's just a matter of how many of us have had those types of quote unquote bad leaders along the way, right? Yeah. Who don't yeah. see the vision. Like your, um, your workplaces had visionary programs that were right. developed, right? And then right. along the way, they became sort of mismanaged. That's what I'm hearing, right? right? They didn't like right. it. So they mismanaged it. Exactly. Um, and then you and your teammates took the brunt of it. Like what is happening? Things were sort of crumb crumbling, right? right? right. So um, I do see a lot of that. And it's, yeah. it's, it's unfortunate when, you know, these types of programs that you are a part of were a while ago, right? Yeah. And yeah. these types of programs now are celebrated, right? For our <laughs> physicians, wellness types of programs are celebrated yes. today, right? Yeah. So it's like thinking back, there are so many ways that we could look at it, right? And attack it. Was it not the right time? Was it not the right time? It happened too soon. So this particular visionary had the vision, but, you know, before it could really take hold, right? Take hold right. and make effective change possible. Right. Um, because now, flash forward in today's landscape, these things are very, very important. Very, in, important. very important in organizations, right? And doctors themselves are talking about these types of programs very, right. very loudly and proudly. They're demanding them. They're demanding, demanding them. them. They're creating Correct. them. They're demanding them. Yes. Correct. Yes. You know, so um, it's an incredible journey that you have faced. And so I totally understand um, your conundrums, your choices right. that, that, that you had to make. And again, as women, the choices that we have to face are going to be different in the economic landscape that we're in, right. right? When you have children, there are many of those choices and sacrifices that we have to make, yeah. right? Like, do we do the aftercare? Right. Do we just <laughs> not do it? Like, when do we do it, right? Do there are so it. many yeah. of these conversations that we have as families um, yeah. that, again, it happens because we are women in the industry. And that's another huge hurdle that we face. And if we don't have Absolutely. people in our teams that are supportive of that, mm -hmm. it poses great difficulty. Yeah. Um, and yeah, you did a lot in terms of your education, right? Yeah. Working and then doing it late at night for hours right. on end. Yeah, it's difficult. Um, it but look, like nobody can take away that education. It's Absolutely yours. Not. I tell yeah. so many new people entering the field is do the education whenever yeah. you can, because nobody can take that, that piece of paper away from you ever. It is no. your education, right. um, you know, and it does go a long way. And networking is key. 
Um, yes. You, know, you do have to keep meeting the right people, getting in Absolutely. the right rooms, you know, and hoping someone along the way is going to open a door. And I know right. that people like you and I, because of our past experiences, we believe in helping other people. We believe in opening the door for those yeah. of us that come after yeah. us, right? Because right. you and I exactly. won't be around forever, you know? Exactly. <laughs> so we have to open the door and help other people um, get to where they want to go. Yeah. Whether it's the hospital yeah. setting, whether it's starting your own company, right? And doing right. it your way on your terms. Right. Um, right. There's so much um, in terms of coaching and advisory that we can do as well. Yeah. So yeah. there's there's just incredible things that I know you are doing um, at your company. So I know we've had a lot to talk about on today's conversation yeah. on your journey, but I would like to know if I could bring you back for another time so we could really get into what your expertise is right now in terms of all of that finance background that you have, um, transitioning into healthcare, and how do you make it all work together in your new company? So if you're amenable to that idea, I would love to hear more about what it is um, you do in terms of your expertise on another conversation that you and I can Absolutely. have together. My pleasure. My yeah? pleasure. Okay. Yeah. Wonderful. So why don't I go ahead and put up a little um, banner here about where folks can find you in the meantime um, on LinkedIn um, for your company details, as well as just get to know about what you post again, because that's how I found you back yeah. in the day um, <laughs> when you're talking about, you know, personal things, which is also yeah. a wonderful way to get to know people, right. As yes. well as what they yeah. talk about for the business side of healthcare and things right. like that. So right. yeah, I would love that. And then here is your company website. Um, so people can investigate that web page as well and see what it is you are offering. But I think if I bring you back next time, I think it'll be another um, remarkable conversation that the audience can digest and, you know, just reflect on their own lives and yeah. important works that they do as well. So, yeah, I love absolutely. it. Yeah, I love it. I, and like you said, I, I'm pretty sure um, there are a lot of similar stories, whether it's in healthcare or, or any other organization. When you go from corporate um, on your own, there's there's probably more than one factor <laughs> that made you do that. Exactly. And, and the pandemic highlighted that, you know, I mean, there are so many, especially women um, in my age group mm -hmm. that just decided, you know what, if I can stay home and take care of my kids and work from home, I can I can do my own. I could be on my own. I could do my own business. I could have my own business. Um, and the pandemic has helped us kind of see that. And people thought I was a little nuts for starting right at the height of the pandemic. But we know that services can be conducted virtually, and um, I think that's um, I think that's uh, something that a lot of women who have so many other responsibilities. Um, got to decide during that time, especially. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. absolutely true. Um, the pandemic definitely allowed people to see things differently, right? right. That they're right. able to take action in a different manner. Um, yeah. I've heard that time and time again as well. And again, everyone's story is different, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And I get it. When to start your own business. I just told my mom, personal note, fun fact, just the other day, because yeah. I yeah. started my own company as well recently after having been right. employed for forever, right? right. And I was like, on that, thank you. And, and I was like, mommy, Martha Stewart only started her empire when she turned 50. And thank my you. mom's like jaw yeah. dropped. She was like, she was 50? <laughs> I was like, yes, mommy. She said it on her master class. <laughs> that she started her empire. It yeah. seems like she started it much younger, but she too yeah. started it at midlife, her own company, her own brand, 
et cetera, right? So right. for women, there's yeah. so much to stew on, to think about, you know, what is going to be best for you and yeah. when, you right. know, you don't have to do it right away when you're 20, when you don't really know what to do, what's, what's mm -hmm. going on, you have no experience, right? Um, yeah. We can definitely talk about this next time when I bring you back. Okay. This is a good, you know, point to end on is experience okay. is really, really key, right? To right. developing um, your own company. All of that experience is yours and you can funnel it into something that is your own. So right. thank you so much for thank being you. on with us today, Sonia. Totally appreciate it. And I cannot <laughs> wait to have you back next time. Thank you. Can't wait to be back. Thank you so much. So that wraps up today's episode. And as always, I appreciate you all diving into today with me. If you want more information from me, please go ahead and follow me on LinkedIn. I'll leave links to everything in the show notes below. All right, you guys. Now, please remember to catch my LinkedIn live broadcast with Betty Hovey on Friday on our Compliance Capers Fireside Chat. This week, we'll be diving into an OIG work plan that's been completed on pain management services. Now, you can also watch it live on my YouTube channel for Paint the Medical Picture. I wish you guys all an amazing and a very, very happy week ahead. Thank you guys so much for listening in on today's very special episode. And I hope every week with me brings you closer to helping your providers paint a masterpiece. See you next Wednesday. <music>